Welcome everyone to the SEAC meeting for Monday, April the 3rd, 2023. Uh, we will get started off with our land acknowledgement this evening. And for tonight, we have Tamara Hannon. Thank you. Simcoe County District School Board acknowledges that we are situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe people. The Anishinaabe include the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We are dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. Great. Thank you so much, Tamara. All right. So welcome, everyone. I wanted to say an extra welcome and hello to our guests this evening. So we have Shannon Thompson, Family of Schools Consultant for Special Education, and Dr. Bronwyn Davis, Senior Psychologist and Manager of Clinical Services. Uh, we also have regrets tonight from Sherry. I'm so sorry, Sherry, you're not here, but I'm going to say your name wrong. The story. Um, so. All right, and welcome to everyone else. All right, so next up we have our SEAC Statement of Beliefs, and I will read that for us this evening. All right, so based on our belief in respect, leadership, integrity, collaboration, compassion, student-driven services, and the right of all students to be included, we advocate that all students have equitable opportunities to learn and participate in inclusive school communities. They are supported in developing and maintaining relationships and participating in freely chosen activities and groups that result in a sense of belonging. Students' unique learning styles are recognized and planned for in a caring and sensitive manner, enabling them to learn and participate with dignity and respect. Students' strengths and special education needs are identified and responded to early, as this is paramount to their growth and development. Based on best practices and research, the SCDSB will adopt proactive, innovative practices to promote individual student capacities and gifts while addressing their special education needs. Education services are delivered using a collaborative and flexible process centered on the strengths and needs of the students, inclusive of family, school, and community, and based on the best learning outcomes for the student. The student's voice is key to all decisions made on behalf of and with the student. All right. Okay, so we'll start off tonight with our approval of the agenda, the agenda. Sorry, I can't talk tonight. All right, so I would be looking for uh, a mover for the agenda as printed to be, sorry, to be approved as printed for uh, Monday, April 3rd, 2023. Do I have a mover for that? Uh, Kevin Berry, second by Trustee Bites. Thank you very much. Uh, all in favor? Great, and any opposed? And that carries. Thank you. All right. So next, I would be looking to move that or for a mover that we approve the minutes uh, from our regular SEAC meeting held March 6, 2023. Do I have a mover for that? Uh, Trustee Bites, thank you. Seconded by Trustee Talbot. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, next up, do we have any uh, declaration of conflict of interest for this evening? Not seeing any. All right. So then we'll move on to B presentations, which we have none. So then we'll move on to C items for decisions. So proposed dates and format for the 2023 2024 special education advisory committee meetings. And we have Superintendent Samus for that. Great. Thank you very much. And to the chair, to the committee. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, and those of you who had an opportunity to be able to read the report, um, the report really is blended in a couple of things blended in. Um, Education Act, amendments to the Education Act, local terms of reference. There are a whole bunch of sort of regulations as well as terms of reference that are approved by the board that come together in this whole process. Um, really, in the first part, really, is, is the regulation 46497. It really sets out that boards have to have a SEAC. So that sort of is the foundation of this process. But it also then leads to um, uh, sort of designating how many meetings need to be able to happen. And so um, it does talk about 10 meetings. Traditionally, we have 11. We have 10 monthly meetings and one special meeting of the uh, business and facilities of the Board of Trustees, as well as SEAC to do with budget. So we actually satisfy that part. Then we went through the pandemic. And for those of you who don't remember the pandemic, because it seems a little while ago in terms of that process, the ministry actually passed, passed an amendment um, that actually allowed boards to be able to have 
uh, virtual meetings or to change the format. And, and I know it sounds pretty comfortable for us to be able to talk about virtual meetings. If we think about, I guess it's about three years ago now at this part, really about this time, it was pretty revolutionary for the idea to be have or to have a electronic meeting. So at that part, the ministry passed uh, uh, an amendment to the regulation that allowed boards to be able to transition to virtual meetings. And again, just to take you back through that time, three years ago, none of us had terms of conditions or terms of reference related to meetings, what they would look like, what would mean all the parts of that. So, you know, as we think this is all pretty easy, actually in three years, we've come a long way to be able to do that. So, you know, again, and I know that's again, hard to remember back three years, it's hard to remember back three months sort of during the pandemic, but as they say that, that happened, that that actual amendment or regulation actually has never been rescinded. So it still allows boards the opportunity to be able to have committee meetings virtually if they need to or in person, depending on the will of the board. And, and we've seen a number of times, whether they are short meetings or long meetings, um, the opportunity to be able to sort of move back and forth between the two of them. Then it intersects into SEAC actually has uh, a terms of a terms of reference that's actually approved by the board that talks about what do agendas look like, what do minutes look like, how do they come to the board, what do all those parts of things. And one of those things talks about actually about sort of the format of meetings and sort of the start times and allows SEAC each year to be able to, by majority vote, determine the start time and the format of the meeting to be able to do that. So, um, so about I think about two weeks ago, we sent out actually a survey to members and got very good response from members. Um, and 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 would I have said I predicted this? Probably not. I probably would have thought that people might have wanted to go back in person. Yet the, the actual support was overwhelming to stay actually in a virtual format. And I know when I talked to to some of my colleagues, they said, "I don't know why you were surprised. We're seeing that more and more that people." like the idea of a virtual meeting. So, um, and on a beautiful night like this, we all might want to drive to the Ed Center and be probably a beautiful drive to come in and out. That said, Simcoe County is a pretty large place. And so um, it does allow the convenience of being able to, to not travel. That said, in, in sort of December, January, February, March, many of our meetings are precarious by the weather in Simcoe County. So as I say, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised that the overwhelming majority of people actually wanted to stay in virtual meetings. So. That became pretty straightforward. The, the discussion then about sort of start times, um, uh, one member could not move it. So being inclusive in that process, we did uh, we did keep it at 6.30 to be able to do that. So the actual, the actual format of the meetings next year by majority vote then become vir uh, virtual um, and the start time remains at 6.30. And if you look at the appendix, the, append the appendix for the actual, it actually identifies the date, so appendix A, we have tried to be able to keep them to the second Monday of each month. There are a couple exceptions to that, whether it's Thanksgiving or spring break or the board historically has a retirement dinner, including this year on the second Monday. So that actually then sort of changes those dates. And to give you an idea why, um, uh, why they're on the second Monday, it really, again, was trying to be able to make sure that if SEAC and part of the, part of the, the uh, Education Act allows SEAC to be able to actually uh, appear in front of the board. So if SEAC actually wanted to delegate the board by putting it on the second Monday would allow SEAC without being time sensitive to be able to actually then present to the board if that was their choice to do, do that. So it did used to be a week later, but we actually moved it forward to be able to allow it. So um, again, if SEAC wanted to be heard by the board, they would have the opportunity without it being time sensitive in terms of a motion. So that's sort of the history of how we get from Education Act to regulation to amendment to terms of reference to surveying members to probably more than you ever wanted to know about all the how we pick dates they they sometimes sound like they just sort of came out of a hat but they actually didn't in terms of that process so with that happy to take uh, questions um, as to that as I say I think it was pretty clear as to what the vast majority of members would like to continue um, and if that's the will of the committee then it needs a recommendation that would come for decision, we would come for a recommendation that the board then approve this as part of the minutes that would again would come back to SEAC in May as the minutes, then they would go to the May meeting and then they'd be uh, considered, that recommendation be considered by the board at the May regular meeting of the board. So with that, again, that gives you probably more information than you ever wanted to know about dates and times of SEAC minutes, but as I say, happy to take any questions.
All right. And do we have any questions or comments? Um, Kevin, go ahead. No questions, but I do have a comment. Um, the decision was made without any discussion at the table to put uh, through just a poll being taken, which is not really a viable way of deciding issues, um, especially since there are arguments to be made one or the other. I mean, admittedly, virtual is the easiest way to hold a meeting, but it's also um, the most unidirectional. Essentially, our meetings since the pandemic have become basically a propaganda piece to throw out what the administration is doing for special ed, but virtually nothing coming up the other way. Because you've separated all the members of the committee, everything is coming from the top down. Um, I'm really against going fully virtual. Um, and I think there really should have been some discussion about this before a poll was taken. Uh, Superintendent Samos? And, and, and I'll say, Kevin, there is still an opportunity to be able to have a discussion at this part. I mean, really at the part of the recommendation based on that, I mean, the discussion can happen at this part. And if the committee does want to change that, they have the opportunity to be able to do that now. So. I mean, otherwise we would have had to survey members at this part to be able to do it. Um, did allow an opportunity to be able to, and my apologies, it was sort of a, um, a way to be able to listen to preferences of members in terms of that. But if committee members don't wanna do it that way and would like to sort of amend the sort of the dates to be able to do that or the format, they're still welcome to be able to do that. Right, thank you, Superintendent Samus. Um, I, I'll just give my feedback there as well. I was hoping for a hybrid. I um, um, I definitely understand where we are a very large county and uh, it can be far for people to get there sometimes. Um, but I, I understand what Kevin's saying as well. You know, the, the conversations and the comfort level sometimes are just not the same when we're virtual. Um, I think a lot of time when people have Maybe if someone has an issue or something they want to talk about, maybe you talk about it a little bit before the meeting or something like that, and you maybe get comfortable to say it in a meeting. Um, I know for quite a while, our maybe the feedback from members was pretty quiet, um, but I do feel like that has changed a little bit in our last few meetings. I don't know if maybe it's it's just kind of taking everyone quite a while to get um, to get comfortable. It's it, it's definitely a different thing to share your your thoughts and questions and feelings when you're you're virtual and you know you're being recorded and streamed, right? So there there's a different comfort level there for sure. Um, so I can I can definitely understand what you're saying, Kevin. Does anyone else have any feedback or or thoughts on the matter? Trustee Bates? Um, yeah, no, I think Kevin makes a good point. Um, I do think, you know, it is convenient and easy. Um, but, you know, I do I do feel like I don't really know, know very many people in the, um, you know, obviously I know Brandy and Robin and I know Kevin um, because I, he's been around for forever. But, um, but there's so many new faces. So I think it would be valuable to um, definitely... Um, have some sort of way that we do uh, get to know each other in person. I don't know if um, a hybrid meeting is the best way or some sort of, um, I don't know, professional development or I, I don't know. But I, I think it would be, I think that that would be very valuable. I think um, online meetings are really great um, and really streamline things. Um, absolutely. But it does, it does make it much harder to get to know each other. So, yeah. All right. Does anyone else have any feedback? Any, I, I guess, any different thoughts from uh, from when we voted originally? Tamara, sorry, did I see your hand? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I don't have any anything different from, and I'm sure, I think I, I preferred the idea of a hybrid, um, primarily because I've only ever attended the meeting virtual, so I don't even know what it could be in person. I imagine there's like more to it if we had the option to come together. I'd love the idea of doing that, even if it was once annually. But I, having said that, I do have like I have um, my my husband's in a rotary meeting on Monday night, so virtual is the only way that I can attend. But we could fight over the occasional in person, I'm sure, and I could and I could attend on occasion. So, um, yeah. But I I get the convenience of of virtual through 
snowstorms and with the travel all over the county, it is, you know, it's not really close for anyone, I guess, to come into the main site. So. Thank you. Uh, Roseanne. Sorry. Yeah, I agree. Like <clears throat> I was, I like the idea of maybe some meetings that are in person and some meetings for, cause it is very cold. It is very, um, and we don't get to know each other, but in the winter months, I definitely do not like driving out there. <laughs> so, but, but before we had some people online and some people at the meeting, couldn't we still do that? Um, and just maybe have so many of the meetings because Kevin's right. Like on, um, nobody gets to know each other. Nobody gets to talk. Nobody gets to really talk about anything. Um, and it, it is, it's harder to talk in these meetings. I find very much so, so. Um, anyway, that's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, so just to clarify, I guess, Superintendent Samus, so if, if we're thinking back to our meetings that we had before the pandemic, we were kind of in the upstairs room where we would have some people had the opportunity to uh, participate on the phone. We would have a speaker there. Um, and then I think we had just a couple of meetings during the pandemic time, but we were allowed back for a little bit. We moved down into the main room um, and the big screen was rolled in that if anyone was on, wanted to be online, they could be online and we would have that big screen there in front of us. So if we were to have any meetings in person, would it be that the later format that we would have or the back to the original? And, and so I'm not a, a tech, um, person is strong with tech to be able to be able to do that. My understanding was if we were going to run a hybrid meeting, it would be in the Roy Edwards room. Um, Cause that was the opportunity to be able to move from sort of a telephone sort of phone in to be able to do it. I think, I think we could all sort of agree that, that having 15 people in a room and three on telephone is hard to be able to hear the people to, unless everyone has a microphone and speaks into it via telephone. The, the, the Roy Edwards room does allow the opportunity to be able to, sort of um, sort of create a, a, a more visual format where you could have people on Zoom to be able to do that, recognizing that the chair and vice chair would have to be there in person. Because you, you can't, you could chair a meeting virtually, but you can't chair or vice chair a meeting when you are virtual and everyone else is in the room to be able to do that. So, um, but as I say, the, the, we would be in the Roy Edwards room to be able to do it if that was our choice. Right. I think okay. Kristen has her hand up in that. Oh, great. Thank you. Sorry, Kristen, please go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, so I didn't have the benefit of being part of this group pre pandemic. So I don't have anything to compare to. But I am curious to know about attendance, because it feels like we have a pretty hearty group here every week. Um, and that attendance is pretty good. And I wonder if that would be the same. I can, you know, obviously, there's going to be the challenges with weather. But even just as, as Tamara was saying, scheduling and, uh, and I guess my other question is, if there's a difference in membership from those of us who live outside the Barry region versus, you know, I can see sort of groups probably trying to put somebody who lives close to Barry to, you know, get to a 630 meeting. Um, so I wonder if there's been changes in the membership since going virtual. And you can probably tell by my line of questioning that I in Midland quite like a virtual meeting at this time of night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So we definitely have had a membership switch since then. Um, we had, it was a different committee back then. So I, I, there are some of us who are the same, but um, we do have a new, a new group. Um, I think that our, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Tina or Chris, but I believe our attendance has always been pretty good. Um, I think our meetings have been attended pretty well. Um, and I, and I think you're correct. I think there. we, I think we generally have had quorum in all of our meetings. There's only been a number of a, couple, a few meetings where we haven't had quorum to be able to do that. Um, and, and that could affect either being in person or not. Um, just looking at sort of the, the feedback when we had sort of in the sort of stop, start, continue last year in June and asked members sort of the strength, the weaknesses of that. Again, the overwhelming group of people were like the convenience of that to be able to do it. I mean, it, you know, at, at the end of the day, I mean, trying to be able to make it so it works for all all committee members so that whether that comes, you know, all the time in person or some of the time in person to be able to do it. I think that we would probably, I mean, if we went to a hybrid meeting, we would generally be the expectations we are there, but we would accommodate someone who's not there as opposed to 
trying to not have a meeting where there's just two of us in a room and everyone else online to be able to do that. So, you know, if we went to a hybrid type of format, it would be an in-person meeting that then accommodates people who can't make it to be able to do that as opposed to sort of come if you want to come to be able to do that. The, the, the expectation would be generally you, you try to be at the meeting if we're going to run an in-person meeting, right? Because I think, you know, back to the idea of the philosophy of an in-person meeting is it allows sort of the idea to be able to read body language and to talk to people and to socialize and all the different parts of that. So, you know, again, you know, I, I, I thought at the beginning that people probably would go towards a, a hybrid type, which and hybrid may not be the correct term for it because hybrid sort of sounds in person that, but have an opportunity where fall and spring would be in person and the winter months we would transition to a virtual to be able to do that. And then we would accommodate people sort of, sort of in the other way, as opposed to sort of the idea of hybrid of some people come and some people don't come. The predominant way would be, it would be an in-person meeting that accommodates or a virtual meeting to be able to do it. Does that make sense? Sort of in that, the idea of, of that process, but I mean, happy to do it either way that the committee wants. If we want to sort of adjust the recommendation, like if we, if we want to re, if we want to re-vote on that to be able to do it. And again, that wasn't really a vote. That was really just a, a preference by sending out an email to people saying, or a survey to say, what are people, what are people's preference? Brandy, I think um, uh, Pam Librelasso has a, has a comment. Oh, thank you, Pam, please go ahead. Um, I was just going to recommend maybe uh, a possibility would be one meeting in the fall and in person and one in the spring, um, and then perhaps the rest online, even just to try that for the next, um, the next year would be a, a happy medium, I think it would avoid the travel during bad weather issue. Um, as long as we avoid September, I think everybody would agree that September would be a bad uh, months to try and come together in person and, and I forgive me I only joined in December so I don't even know if there is a meeting normally in September so but I just wanted to throw that out there Thank and, you. and a reminder that our our meeting with the the uh, coming later this month so which I believe is April 19th you know probably correct me if I'm wrong in that process that our joint meeting between uh, business facilities the board of trustees and SEAC is an in-person meeting um, and and many members of this committee will will know that we we have worked our way through that, but that usually is about 40 or 50 people as a virtual meeting. So it probably actually is probably best to be an in-person meeting because of that. But um, again, happy to be able to make it work for the community members so that it's um, meets everyone's needs to be able to do it. Yes. All right, so I feel like now as chair, I don't know where to take us with this. <laughs> um, I'm thinking, I don't know, the. I mean, the poll was very clear. I was clearly one of the people who did not vote for all online. I'm having a feeling that Kevin was not either. <laughs> um, but um, I know, I mean, we do need to accommodate the the majority of the group. Um, I guess I just should ask if, ask if everyone, I guess, had went into the poll with that full understanding that say maybe we had, you know, a, a meeting in the fall and a meeting in the spring, in person that there would be a virtual option as well that you you know if you do live far away and you're unable to make it or if you have a conflict that you would still be able to join virtually now that we're kind of discussing it is anyone sitting there thinking that that really would not work for me or does everyone kind of think yes i could make that work uh trustee talbot and then roseanne Yes, uh, we're having a straw straw poll. I just want to uh, stress that uh, it's a 45 minute drive for me. We're averaging with all the special meetings, it seems to be one a week. So the less time I in, in my life I spend in the car and going to meetings so that we can do virtually, I'm, uh, I'd be sure in favor of virtual continuation, but uh, just, just my perspective, that's all in my opinion. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Roseanne, you were next. Yeah, I, I, my vote was for like they had choices there and one of them was hybrid was your first vote and that's what I voted for. But then it said second vote was online so and I like the idea just a few meetings is fine just as long as we get connected somehow. Um, that's okay like it's just it, it is easier not to drive out there for sure, but I think that we should get together once in a while. That's all. 
Mark, Can I just, you, oh yeah, Tamara, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say like um, hearing people talk about hybrid, it, it's clear like the definition differs for different people. Like when I thought of hybrid, I didn't think half of us are in person, half of us are virtual. I thought some meetings in person and some meetings virtual. So that definition really defined and, what and, we meant by that. Tamara, that was what we meant by hybrid in that. So you're, what you're illustrating now is what we thought of hybrid where some would be in person and some would be virtual. Okay. Was there anyone else I thought I saw Mark? Yes, I thought I saw your hand, Mark. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm going to add um, too much of value. Um, I work for the town of Collingwood and our committee and council nights are typically Mondays. Um, for most of the past uh, number of years, I've gotten lucky most of the time in that my if I do have to attend council, it's over before SEAC. Um, back when we were running seven o'clock meetings, the chance of me getting out of council and, and getting um, to Midhurst on time was pretty good. Um, so I was I was going with the later start times and so on, but the 6:30 start seemed to work and it certainly works virtually because, um, that would be time that I would be traveling anyway to get to a seven o'clock meeting. So that seemed to make, seem to work. Um, right now they're, they're debating a different council, uh, meeting structure. So I don't know where this is all going to settle out. And, um, uh, and for that matter, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be the, the representative for my group. So I don't want to tie down SEAC by any of my preferences. I would love to have a hybrid model because I do think there is benefit to attending in person. And I mean, this is uh, something that I volunteered for and I should be prepared to make that commitment to come and, and attend in person from time to time. If we could have a hybrid model where there were a couple of meetings that were in person Hopefully that would work out in terms of my schedule. And, but I don't want to, as I said before, I don't really want to tie SEAC down to my particular needs. I just know that the virtual, virtual or a hybrid model would probably work best. I'm in the same boat as trustee Talbot in that um, my drive time from Collingwood to Midhurst is, well, it's probably about 40 minutes, sometimes 45 when they're doing construction. Anyways, that's all. All right. Well, thank you for the, uh, the feedback, Mark. Um, okay. I don't want to take us too long on this. I don't, I keep committing to getting us out of here on time. So how about, let's say, can we have a really informal, no pressure, give your honest answer. Let's have a couple questions with hands and then we'll go from there. So um, I would, okay. So can I request if you put up your hand, if you would prefer to just stay virtual? fully every meeting to stay virtual. And if you could leave your hand up for a moment, just so I can count. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so, and then can I ask, so having discussed what we are thinking of as what a, uh, a hybrid would be, so maybe a meeting at the beginning and a meeting at the end that would be in person, but there would be an opportunity for people to join virtually as well. Can I see a show of hands if that is what you would prefer? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that one is overwhelmingly the winner this time. <laughs> so, um, so having said that, but I feel that, that that would probably be a good option because it does still give those who are from far away, it does still give the option that they could join virtually still as well. Does that sound like it makes sense? I'm seeing some nodding heads, yes. Okay. And trustee Great. Rafiq, can we just clarify? So are we talking sort of like September, October, November, April, May, June? Are we talking September and June? Um, just sort of, we sort of, because we're going to have to come up with sort of a clear wording yes. recommendation <laughs> as to what. Yes. Um, I was thinking like June is usually the easiest. I'm guessing the weather would be nice, hopefully by June. And um October can be iffy. I don't know, Pamela, you mentioned not September. Uh, Trustee Bites, I see your hand there. 
Yes, I was going to say, um, uh, Chair Rafiq, um, June is incredibly busy for trustees. Right. And so I (laughs) would maybe like to suggest April or May as a spring uh, thing. Um, I don't know what the thing is September. Um, I think we have it earlier in October because of Thanksgiving, because I think I made a faux pas last October um, with my scheduling. Um, But I would just, I would avoid June. Right. (laughs) You're always saying. Thank you. I wasn't thinking with my trustee hat. Um, so maybe like October and May, Superintendent Samus, sorry, I saw your hand there. And, I, and I'm not a trustee, so I can't speak to sort of the busyness of June other than the school business of June. There are a lot of things that happen in June, whether they're kids' graduations, whether they're kids' transitions. Um, I, I would say probably our um, the hardest month probably to get quorum would be December and June, right, in terms of December with the busyness of sort of season things that happen there. Um, but I would probably say if you're looking at two meetings. I would think May and October would be probably the easiest to be able to do. It allows us to be able to start in September um, and then come together with sort of um, keep in mind that those two would be in person, but you're right. We could accommodate people that can't travel to the ed center, but the general idea would be the other ones would be online and those would be in person for those that can make it to the ed center. Okay, uh, Kevin. Um, I'm not sure why we need to decide tonight which ones are in person. If we simply say these are the dates to be held either in person or online at the discretion of the chair. And we can discuss between us over the next couple of months what the best thing is. Otherwise, we'll never get anything done in time to get back and forth to to the board okay. Yes. Do we do we need to have that? We don't need to have that so, part. Right? So we, we we do need to be able to have this appear to be approved at at May to get. We do have a month leeway because we actually by the time we get this to be to go to being sort of approved by board does have to appear sort of by June, which means we have to at least have decided this by May so that it ends up coming back to SEAC in June and going to June board meeting. Right. So as part of the terms of reference, it does talk about sort of the dates and times of this. But I think you know, I'll have to go back to it does talk about the format of the meetings as well in the terms of reference. So there is an expectation that we would determine what the format of the meetings would be if we're going to leave it to the discretion of the chair month to month to be able to do that. I think that is difficult for people to plan. OK, including uh, including our IT staff that then have to determine, are we booking permits at the education center? Are we bringing in staff? for evenings at the Ed Center to be able to do that. So right. I don't think we can wait till September, October to be able to make that decision. If the okay. decision is made tonight, the decision needs to be made by the next meeting so that it can play its way through its course to get to the board prior to the end of the year. Okay, so can I ask by an informal, again, show of hands, who is okay with um, virtual, for all of our meetings except in person for hopefully October and May, but you would have the option to be virtual at attend those meetings virtually as well. Sorry, just by an informal show of hands. And Brandy, I think George Houghton has his hand up. So sorry, George, were you, I took your hand as voting. Were you voting George or did you have something to add to that? Uh, No, I was voting. Okay. Oh, my apologies. Sorry. (laughs) Thank you. Okay. Sorry, so, I missed. I, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm thinking that it looks like everyone is good with that, with the October and May in person, but you do have the option to join virtual, and the rest of our meetings would be online. Kevin. No one to throw a monkey wrench in here, but of course, if we have October and May, May is the double meeting. What do we have? Two in persons. April. April. Okay, that's good. All right, fine. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm just looking at the recommendation. So the recommendation is that we are voting on what is set out in Appendix A. So and so we would then have to amend. Procedural. Yes. <laughs> the dates would stay the same. We would amend the format to be able to list sort of above 
they would all be as virtual except for the meetings sort of in October and May would be in person would be denoted beside that on the chart. Right. And do we need to have that sent to us again before we can vote on that? Or we can we just say that that's what we're changing it to? I think we can say we're, that's what we're changing it to. Okay. All right. So in the, um, I can't even think of what I'm trying to say now. <laughs> in the respect of time, <laughs> I am going to say that. Um, so, and again, please vote how you want to vote, but let's let's try that to see if we can move us along here, that um, that we will update the appendix to say that our meetings in May and October will be uh, in person with the option of virtual. All right, so that's where I'm going with this as I read our recommendation. If I'm not doing something correct, oh, Tina, you're coming to tell me I'm doing Tina, it wrong. I think here. we would put the word amended before <laughs> no, appendix A, is that correct? going to be correct. And what I can do is I can attach the ap amended appendix to the minutes. Okay, Yeah. so I, I'm good to, do you want me to add in the word amended? Um, I think so. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. That was a really long discussion, but here we go. Let's try it. <laughs> All right. So I'm looking for a mover that the SEAC adopt the proposed dates, times, dates, and format as set out in appended, or sorry, appended. Now look at me. Amended Appendix A of report number SEAC C1A proposed dates and format for the 2023 Special Education Advisory Committee meetings dated April 3rd, 2023. Do I have a mover for that? Trustee Bites, do I have a second? Uh, Trustee Talbot, thank you. All right, now the big question, all in favor? Oh, I'm seeing lots of hands. Wonderful, any opposed? Sorry, I just wanna ask that question again because I wanna be clear. Any opposed? Kevin, sorry, not trying to call you out, just trying to make sure I'm right. Okay, I thought I saw a virtual hand, but I think it was just coming down. Okay, all right, so then that carries. Yes, okay, all right, thank you. And thank you for your feedback, Kevin, to prompt the discussion, because I do think it's important. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I'm gonna try and move us along quickly. <laughs> um, all right, so that takes us to two staff reports. Uh, no, sorry, not at all. <laughs> all right, D, items for information. Follow up from previous meetings. We have none. Um, so, sorry, we do have some. Look at me, I'm just all over the place now. SEAC member advocacy, special education funding. funding. And uh, my name is beside that, so I better get it together and what I'm trying to say here. All right, so we had discussed um, our last meeting quite a bit. We had an update on budget, and we had discussed possibly uh, writing a letter to the Minister of Education to advocate some changes uh, about special education funding. Uh, we discussed a few different things. Um, one of the main things that I, I think we all agreed that was really affecting us was that uh, our numbers are being taken from the 2006 census data. Um, it is 2023. That is a very big gap. I think we would all agree that Simcoe County has changed drastically since then. Uh, and I think that is one thing that really needs to be addressed with the ministry to make sure that our needs as our county are being met. Um, we discussed a couple of other things, um, some changes um, in the, uh, the SIP uh, funding and that uh, there were some things that need to be changed there. Um, we talked about a, a few different things. So we just had said that we would set aside some time to kind of just continue that discussion. Um, so I definitely would love to hear from anyone. Um, I do think Kevin had something to kind of start us off there. Oh, you're muted, Kevin. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we started uh, put forward a motion uh, to the effect that the Simcoe County District School Board Special Education Advisory Committee recommend that the board approve a letter written by the SEAC chairperson and vice chairperson to the Minister of Education addressing the concerns related to special education funding. Now, of course, you probably just have to, the first motion would be a request to be written and then we'd have to request to be approved, I would imagine. Yeah, so I think, uh, so the way that it would go is that we would uh, we would vote on a motion now, if we have it moved and seconded, that the chair would write a letter um, expressing our concerns. And then, so our minutes will come back to us next month 
we uh, we as a committee will approve our minutes and then those minutes will go to the board of trustees. The board of trustees would then approve or not approve that recommendation. Uh, and if it is approved, then as soon as the board of trustees approve that recommendation, the letter can be sent. So we would have we could have the letter ready to go uh, to time with that board meeting. So as soon as it's approved, it could go. Do I do I have that correct, Superintendent Samus? And, and you're correct. So, so the SEAC is a consultative committee, um, and I think there is value in SEAC writing the letter because I think it allows the opportunity for advocacy to come from people that actually directly support students and families with special education needs. So I think there is, I don't say the word credibility in that because there's credibility at all levels in terms of that, but there is sort of an authenticity in that process. So, um, but it would allow um, SEAC to be able to make a recommendation that the board approve SEAC writing a letter to that. It also does give an op another opportunity later on if there's a willingness to have the board then write a letter beyond that. So it does give multiple steps in that process that allows sort of that part. And I, and I will say that, and I know there are a number of trustees on this, including Trustee Rafiq, who's the vice chair of the board. So, um, uh, I mean, the committee will be aware that that actually about a year ago this time, the board actually wrote a letter to the ministry with regards to a number of funding challenges, including transportation and special education. And uh, um, I'd have to go back and remember that letter, the parts of that. I think it was about enrollment pressures in new schools and a variety of things like that. So, um, but I think there would be value. I think the important part in this would be, again, are there specific themes that would represent sort of in, and as Trustee Rafiq talked about, sort of census data reflecting the, the composition of Simcoe County in 2023. There are a number of things that have come to sort of this committee about discussion related to funding, you know, whether that's transportation as affects it, whether that's uh, facilities and new schools and available space and clinical staff and a whole bunch of things that all impact services that are provided. The, the part in terms of time sensitivity in this and well, the board has actually not received its budget at this part. It would be, I don't want to say safe for me to assume that much of the funding decisions for this year must be already done by the time you calculate all the, the parts to do with funding, given that the provincial budget has already been passed. So it's probably imminent that we will receive sort of our board budget, which includes special education. So while it sounds like there's time sensitivity in terms of the discussion for this year, probably a bigger part is the, the future trends and the impact of special education funding and changes of demographics and needs coming out of the pandemic and a whole bunch of sort of longer term trends that will probably affect special education funding sort of not only this year, but for many years to, to come in terms of that process. But I believe that the part that would be that would make sense would be what are some of the general themes that we should think about in terms of what would SEAC like to advocate for? And if those themes then become sort of clear to be able to do it, then as I say, Kevin would put forward a recommendation there to require a seconder. The committee would then vote on doing that, of which that recommendation would can come to the board to vote on to do that. The letter would then be written by the chair uh, and vice chair of SEAC, but then distributed to all SEAC members prior to being distributed to the Ministry of Education so that SEAC members could say, no, I didn't really want to talk about that. Maybe we should have talked sort of about that. But as I say, a number of... Um, a number of things that we've seen over the last number of years in terms of the the growth of the growth of enrollment and the growth of complexity in the pandemic which i think our students would benefit from in terms of making sure the funding kept up with that with that need to be able to do that the other part i think to to keep in mind um in this whole process in terms of i mean it, and i'll say i don't say it's every dollar but almost every single dollar in special education goes to people. And when you ask families and when you ask schools, what do they want in special education? They want people. They want teachers and educational assistants and clinical staff like psychologists and psychometrists and speech pathologists. Um, and really the funding goes to help people, right? And to provide people to be able to support. So as I say, it's... Um, um, Anyway, that's sort of sort of a long story as to how we sort of get there to be able to do that. But Trustee Rafiq or Vice Chair Rafiq, Chair Rafiq, I was thinking sort of the other committee, you're actually correct in terms of the process of it would actually come through SEAC. SEAC would make a recommendation that would come back to minutes, then it would go to the board. The board would part the letter would be written, including being 
redistributed back to SEAC so that SEAC would be able to provide input. And then that author that letter would be authored by the chair and vice chair of SEAC to the Minister of Education. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you for the clarification, Superintendent Samas. Um, okay, so just to to clarify, so yes, I would agree. I I I like kind of not playing all of our cards at once. I think that um, the letter would have value coming from SIAC. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Told me I was unstable. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think the letter has value coming from SIAC, and then that we could possibly later on have a letter coming from the board of trustees as well, if that was necessary. Um, and like I said, um, I think the main things that we had discussed were the SIP funding, the 2006 census data, um, talking about the complexity of needs with uh, with students since, especially since the pandemic, um, and then transportation needs within special education funding as well. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll read that um, the recommendation from Kevin again, the motion, and then see if we have a seconder and then see if anyone has any other things to add from that. Um, so the motion would have been from Kevin that the Simcoe County District School Board Special Education Advisory Committee recommend that the board approve a letter be written by the SCDSB SEAC chairperson and vice chairperson to the Minister of Education addressing concerns related to special education funding. So would we have a second for that motion? Uh, Roseanne, great, thank you very much. All right, um, so any further discussion or comments, any other topics anyone feels that would like to be included, um, we can always follow up with email as well. You know, if someone has something that they would like to make sure we're adding in and has other thoughts, we can follow up with an email. Um, but just anything else right now, Trustee Bites? Yeah, I just wasn't sure because I know that there's so many issues we've talked about, but definitely... Um... Uh, and it, I guess it, it wouldn't have to be a big focus, but just the, um, and I guess this goes with this statistic part, but the overcrowding really um, makes special education, do you know what I mean? Like it's just an extra pressure, um, just as a small, I'm sure you would add that in anyway, but I wasn't sure if you'd mentioned that, but I think it kind of encompasses it all, but. Great, thank you, Trustee Bites. Um, yes, I don't. I hadn't actually said that, but yes, um, you know, we are desperate for for more schools and more capital funding within our board. Um, I think we've talked about if you kind of look at it across the board, we're we're basically ten schools behind, or will be, and and we need we need more schools built, which of course will translate to to room for our special education classes as well. So we can definitely include that as well. Um, Okay, um, I'm not seeing any more hands right now. So, would you guys, would you like me to read the motion one more time, or am I okay to call all in favor? All right, I think we had it read there a couple times. So, um, so I'll, I'll just ask: Is all in favor for that motion? All right, and oh, sorry, Kevin, did you have, was that a wave or a vote? A vote. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, all right, is anyone opposed to that motion? Thank you, all right. All right, so then that does carry. Sorry, Kevin, that's the uh, the virtual trying to read body language, trying to figure out if it's a vote or a wave or uh, trying to get my attention. <laughs> all right, okay, so then that does carry. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so like I said, Kevin and I will work on that letter um, with Chris and Tina. And if anyone has anything specific that you would like to be included, uh, please feel free to email us and uh, and we'll work through that and make sure we're getting everyone's uh, everyone's concerns in there. Excellent. All right. I love to see the advocacy. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. So then that takes us to our staff reports. Uh, so A, welcoming our youngest learners by supporting the transition to kindergarten. And we have Superintendent Samus and Shannon Thompson. Thank you very much. I'm going to start and then turn it over to, to Shannon to speak. So give you a little bit of background. If you've not been in a school since sort of when you were in school as a child yourself, kindergarten is a little bit different. So um, prior to 2010, kindergarten used to be either, depending on the board, half days or alternate days, um, really was a significant uh, different program. In 2010, the Ontario Minister of Education brought in play-based learning, which was full day kindergarten, um, which 
changed a number of things, including kids who used to go either every other day, A day, B days, and every other sort of Monday, Wednesday, and every other Friday or Tuesday, Thursday, every other Friday. Um, that was what our board did. Other boards did mornings or afternoons. Um, and so full day kindergarten brought in sort of a, a brand new curriculum that was play based based on a number of different uh, research studies to be able to do that. Um, the the part that, you know, if you, again, if you go back to that part, significant renovations to boards, changes of staffing models, uh, renovations to virtually every one of our schools, the actual size of classrooms was changed to be able to do that. So um, lots of regulations related to size of classrooms, makeup of classrooms, staffing of classrooms. Um, and then over the space of about 2010 to about 2013, um, across our board, we implemented in full day kindergarten. So it sort of went through that whole process, including sort of then starting to look at before and after care in schools and a whole bunch of different things that sort of came in in that process. And so that, you know, again, sounds like that's a long time ago to be able to do that. That actually, but as they say, is is really not that long ago to do that. When we start talking about engaging our, our uh, newest learners, in which we welcome about 3,500 new junior kindergarten students every year. So when you think of the size and scale of 3,500 new students arriving at sort of 87 different schools to be able to do it is quite a process of really onboarding all those children and families. And so earlier this year, when we started doing our, our welcome to kindergarten nights, we had our first night, which was a virtual night to be able to do that. We had a thousand unique users log into that. So when you think about sort of um, sort of you know the the engagement of our of our of our families when their kids are starting school, it's an incredibly engaging time at a time that 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 families are nervous, they're excited, they're optimistic, they're scared, they're happy. There are a whole bunch of things if you've ever been with a, a parent as their children are getting ready to be able to join junior kindergarten. So um, an incredibly exciting time. That said, for for children, for families who have children that may have special education needs, it's also a pretty stressful time in terms of what is school going to look like, what are the staff going to look like, where are the school going to go. Some of our families um, who have children with special education needs may have never played with other kids before. Like it's a whole brand new world to be able to do that. Or they may have been in a in a home daycare that had one or two other students, and now all of a sudden they're transitioning to a school, and that's a huge step for for all families and probably even more so than uh, for students, for families who have children who have who have unique needs. So we actually task one of our, our consultants really to have an early years portfolio. And I won't go sort of all the history of Shannon because it'll make Shannon seem sort of old in terms of all the things that she's been involved in um, experience in terms of that and sort of the unique parts in terms of developing the tips document that many other counties and boards have actually stolen sort of the, the incredible work that, that Shannon was involved in early on. But if there's anyone who understands the whole process of how do we welcome students from across the entire county, it really is Shannon has a pretty good relationship with, with all the county providers and all the different types of organizations that support students and families as they transition to school. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to take you through some of the uh, things that we do to be able to welcome students. And again, a pretty large number of students at the same part, a pretty well-organized machine in terms of setting out sort of consistent structures so that we try to get sort of a sort of a similar process all the way through. So schools and families and, and um, know what the process is. So it's not sort of left up to chance in terms of how do students and families arrive at kindergarten on that first day of September to be able to do that. So Shannon, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about sort of the whole process. Again, uh, in the report that you have, it actually details some of the different uh, parts that are put through that we work with our schools to be able to set out the timelines and the steps to go through it to get consistency across the board. But Shannon, I'll turn it over to you to talk about sort of the actual specifics of the process. Thank you, Chris. And I'll apologize in advance. I'm Change the order of some of those slides. I thought it made more sense to do some of the general uh, topics before the um, changes this year. And uh, Lise, Lindsay Massacott can certainly attest to how much time and energy Simcoe County partners um, put into making transition to school as smooth as possible. And this past year, especially, we've, we've put a major push into engaging as many um, parents as we can. So I'm just going to share my screen here.
Chris, can you give me a thumbs up if my screen is sharing properly? Okay, thank you. So firstly, Chris was mentioning the number of elementary schools. We actually have, I think, 86 schools that have kindergarten programs in our board, and every year we have turnover. So we get one staff member in each school to um, be on our transition school team. And then of course, over the course of the school year or over the summer, they move to a different school. So um, generally speaking, according to my polling results, we have about 30% turnover, which is I think pretty consistent, but we have a new staff member with a large learning curve because there are a lot of moving parts and transition to school. So um, about the time that families are registering their children um, for kindergarten, we are reaching out to schools to see um, which staff members need, uh, you know, an overview, which staff members would like a refresher on the transition to school system, because um, there are there are a handful that uh, are consistent year after year. And then in other schools, we have a brand new staff member who does not have training on the shared electronic record, for example. Um, and some users who have not been on the share on the shared record for nine months, so um, they are uh, their passwords have expired, or they need to have new training on privacy and confidentiality. So there's just a lot of advanced preparation put into making sure our staff schools are ready to accept families who are bringing children who might have some special needs. And our our uh, registration process used to include parents coming into the office and filling out a large kindergarten questionnaire. And it's evolved over the last few years to an online registration process. And uh, this very, well, I guess it was about two pages of questions. There are four questions that prompt families to share if they happen to have any concerns about their child's development and if they, if they have or have not accessed supports in their um, community yet. So when we, sorry, I have another phone call coming in the house. When, um, as soon as the parents register, the office administrator has access to an SQL report and we ask that they check regularly starting transition to school because we still have a window of time to direct families to early intervention, which is great. Uh, this January, we did a Facebook Live and Jamie Upham from our early years, um, along with one of our DECEs, um, had 250 viewers on a half hour Facebook Live and then 5,000 views on YouTube. So that was pretty exciting. And we are committed to doing at least one or two next year, but starting in the fall, because as Chris was mentioning, the, the excitement about come, uh, registering for school really does start before January <laughs> of their school year. Um, we've done a couple of virtual um, parent information sessions, and um, they've been, I would say, 40, 50 people, but they're recorded and um, are also shared on YouTube, and they're shared with families who were not able to so that, that big information session um, is still happening, and that's uh, done collaboratively with all the early intervention partners, and again, Lindsay Mascot can attest to <laughs> that she, she's she been the chair <clears throat> until just, just last year. Um, we released the memo, memo, excuse me, and the profiles, which I will just highlight here, actually started going out today. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but um, the infant child development program has gone out as well as some of the area profiles. So uh, the schools are all prepped to receive them. They know from the memo exactly what to do with that information. Again, the office administrators are checking those registrations, and if there are any red flags for um, parents who have concerns about their child's development, those phone calls are going right out. So um, a lot of uh, certs and schools are reaching out to families starting about this week. Um, they have um, shared that they have concern about their child's development. Moving this camera around. Um, let me just see. Uh, that would be a review for you probably that the profiles have a section on there about early intervention recommendations, whether or not as a school system we prepare visuals, we prepare um, transition narratives, and whether there's a recommendation for a staff member to visit care or visit 
um, the preschool, which was always my favorite part um, when a teacher actually gets out of the school. And now they are doing in-person observations again, which is lovely because um, obviously for reasons I won't mention, we haven't been able to do in-person observations for the last little while. As well, um, we're pretty excited about having the um, orientation to kindergarten sessions in April, May, June, um, where they actually come into the kindergarten and get the feel of a kindergarten classroom. Those are happening in person as well. Um, as well in the recommendation section, they're um, reaching out to families to arrange um, transition SNCs and get permission to, act to access the shared electronic record. So all those introductions are starting now, which is exciting. In May and June, we hold our transition uh, meetings, which again, in depending on the family's preference and the school's ability to accommodate, there, some of those are happening virtual and some of them are happening in person. And again, I, I was mentioning the Welcome to Kindergarten events. They're all scheduled. They're all on the public website. Um, and wow. I'm hoping are going to be very well attended. They're, they're um, pretty important evenings. The Transition Integrated Program page, which you see over here in the bottom left, will be presented. It's actually due at the Transition to School meeting, but it's posted on the shared electronic record as soon as it's finalized with the family. And we no longer have this uh, modified to schools outside of Barry Bradford and Innisfil. We're receiving a blue tip because um, Soldiers yeah. Memorial Hospital wasn't engaging in not engaging they weren't collaborating on the tip they were actually posting their discharge in their um, older style on the shared electronic record so everyone's at the table again which is exciting and we don't have to talk about the blue tip hopefully for <laughs> for a while um, I should mention that entry to school through the Ontario Autism Program um, they're they've started their first cohort in March I think March 6th and um, they are going to actually be ending their program in August. So in uh, at the end of the summer, they will prevent, uh, present a group-based summary report. So some of our children coming in through early intervention will actually be um, attending and entry to school. Um, so six weeks, of, sorry, 12 weeks of sessions as well. So they'll get support through early intervention and also get support through the Ontario Autism Program, which is wonderful. Some changes in the, or I guess not necessarily brand new changes, but um, the online registration set, excuse me, there's a phone call happening here, it's distracting me. Um, the online registration um, reports are accessible from January, excuse me, all the way to September. Registration information for early on. We've been partnering a lot with the early on centers, which um, support families zero to six, not just zero to entry to school. And we've been sharing information on their Getting Ready for K program, which um, are starting April to June. And they are four week sessions with a child and I believe the family um, in the session. So that's exciting that we've been sharing that with every registrant and they said that their registrations have shot up, which is also great. For families who are not involved with early intervention at the time of registration, we have a, a, a clear pathway for who to direct um, those families to call if they would like to um, get some screening done. The resource consultation program, if they're in licensed daycare and if they're on a and if they're on a wait list at this time, they are eligible for that program. The early on centers, we can direct them uh, to their local early on center and they have access to screening services there. The memo um, gives the number for children's development services. And we also are going to be sharing the new Smart Start Hub through Children's Treatment Network, which is going to be, um, I, I believe um, going forward is going to be one of the main ways we direct families to um, have that one phone call where they support um, at they screen and they do help the family um, get directed to the services that they're eligible for. I mentioned the three supported transition pathways, the RC program, infant child development program through Empower Simple, and the entry to school program. So the vast majority are coming in through the RC program, um, about 8% through the infant child development program, and entry to school can actually work in conjunction with those, so they're not included on the chart. Some interesting numbers. 
um, the total is in red at the bottom and you can see that this year where the other years were between 350, 407, uh, 358, this year it says 225 and that's not uncommon to have about 100 more trickle in between now and uh, midsummer. So these are totals from the entire year. And uh, like I said, I'm just pro uh, processing them right now, but you can see the, where those totals fall. About 45% coming in from Barry, And then we have Bradford Innisfil at 14.2, Aurelia area. I was told that you like numbers. <laughs> and I always like going back into my old, um, into my historical files to, to see the differences as well. So just some interesting um, information there. These are three layers of parent outreach that we've been doing. And I mentioned those 5,000 views on the Facebook Live. Um, the welcome to school um, parent evenings, those, like I said, are going, uh, were recorded and will also be posted. And that's just a small picture of that getting ready for K. Um, the, the sessions that are running through early on. And I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shannon. Lots of great information. All right. Uh, do we have any? Oh, <laughs> that's perfect. Now I can see everyone. Thank you. All right. Do we have any questions or comments from the committee? All right. Uh, Pamela, please go ahead. Um, I just wanted to mention, I appreciated when you mentioned that the registration um, is now online versus going into the office. Um, I think from other families that I've spoken to, and it's certainly something I experienced myself, it was a bit of a shock going into the office and having all of these checklists and you're checking off all the things your child can't do. And it's a very emotional experience to have in yeah. front of office staff that you've never met before. I remember the secretary having to give me Kleenex. Um, so I really, really appreciate that that's been added in um, to sort of make it a bit smoother for families. And my other question was, I know you said that obviously for reasons we won't mention that there haven't been the in-person um, outreach sessions for parents, but that you're going to be starting them again. And I'm just wondering, I know um, before what we won't talk about, um, they did have <laughs> parents that attended that, um, and I was actually one of them that attended one year as somebody who had already been through the process to talk to families about, you know, um, what to expect. And it was a little different coming from uh, a, a parent versus school staff. Um, and I'm just wondering if any thought had been given to that, um, you know, families that have had a positive transition experience to maybe go and share that with, to be available to talk to families. Yes, thank you, Pam. Um, I think I was referring to the kindergarten orientation evenings that are coming back to in-person, but we have a transition to school subcommittee that meets um, usually once every two months. And we really unpacked, um, you know, what, what, how the group felt about the transition to school virtual. And um, we talked about, you know, all, how that ran across the county. There were six different nights where we traveled to um, all the different early intervention sites. And while there were there were a lot of benefits, and we talked about how um, when Graz used to present in Barry, and just having a principal there, and the focus of the transition to school information, um, and how we were kind of not talking about how, you know how how a parent is the partner in this, and how uh, what they should expect in September. We were we were talking about all of these supports and what discharges and you know, and what special education looks like in school. So I think as a group, we are really um, focused on making that um, a, a different experience for families next year. I don't know about the in-person ones because of the, the time of year that we used to hold them. It was trying to get everybody out, you know, at seven o'clock in January or February. So we've also been talking about the benefits of really starting those information sessions and soft transfer sessions in the fall versus in the winter. So I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of um, positive change and tweaks in what that's going to look like next year. And I'm not sure if there might be a few um, in-person ones 
um, or whether we're really going to turn this virtual thing on at zero. I can't guarantee, but we are always talking about it. And I appreciate your perspective. <laughs> always. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Shannon. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, okay. I have a question. It's it's probably a big question, but I guess I'm just looking for a, a quick answer. <laughs> um, you know, over the, the last few years, I feel like we've talked about here quite a bit that a lot of kids um, ended up showing up at school in September without a lot of the resources that they would have had um, and maybe slipping through the cracks and we weren't really aware of all the complexity of needs that they had until they showed up at our doors. Um, so I guess what I'm thinking about, you know, things kind of were starting to open up a little bit last spring. So I, I guess I'm just kind of wondering, was it a little bit better in that regard this year? Is it too early to tell? Are you kind of hoping that it'll be a lot better by next September? Is there is there a feel for that that type of thing yet? Um, I'm hoping that this year, just I'm not sure if any of my fellow school personnel want to answer, but I feel like this year um, is pro we're probably kind of stepping over a threshold that next year with all of this push, there are so many more children who are um, participating in these getting ready for school. We're having them in the school in May, um, you know, just uh, really sharing what an early on can do for a family and all families are, you know, able to access early on. So I'm really hoping that people are getting out of getting out of the house and kids are getting a lot more socialization. I'll stop talking, Chris, because I feel like you want to say something. <laughs> You know, I, 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 Shannon, you are far more eloquent than I am and knowledgeable sort of early years than I am. So I, I'm I'm always in awe of sort of your amount of knowledge to be able to do that. The the one thing I will add in that process is, um, uh, Chair Afik, you are correct. I mean, the, the kids that joined us sort of the last couple of years, I mean, had very few experiences outside of whether those are clinical opportunities for clinical services or whether that's just having play dates with friends, right, to be able to do that. So we did see sort of kids joining us in kindergarten, you know, many of which had never had never had a play date, right? And so, um, and 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 that wasn't I mean, I mean, so we saw sort of a sort of a confounding part, kids who 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 benefited significantly from clinical supports prior to coming to school, quite often those were not available. But kids who who just would have benefited from having play dates and working on oral language and socialization and self-regulation and sharing a truck would be would be we're not provided that opportunity and so there i mean i'll say you know those kids have sort of showed great resilience this year because they've been exposed to lots of different things um but there is most definitely a, a vulnerability gap that kids who who didn't have those opportunities early on that will take us a number of years to be able to sort of to uh, provide support in terms of those processes um, the one thing that that we did find out recently is um, we are actually doing what's called EDI, which is the uh, the vulnerability screening. So all of our year two kindergarten students who are going to get screened this spring. Um, so that's planning sort of in the works now to be able to be rolled out so that. Um, uh, and I don't know, the committee wouldn't remember this. We didn't do it during COVID, but really there was a through McMaster through the Orford Center, an opportunity to be able to me measure uh, vulnerability, a number of different indexes that we're going to do for our kindergarten students this spring. So that will give us a, it won't give us comparison to last year, but it will give us comparison to sort of 2019 that we'll be able to see sort of where of our, where do our kindergarten students fall in terms of, in terms of sort of a comparison before. Um, and there's quite a bit of longitudinal data that tracks both individual kids as well as cohorts, as well as a comparison of cohorts to be able to do that. So that will give us some really nice data to be able to see that. Um, some of the interesting trends that we saw, and I know we're way off topic, but it sort of sort of follows in terms of measuring where are our kids at to be able to do it. We did see a trend in terms of self-regulation actually improving over sort of the 2015 to 2019, but we saw actually oral language decreasing going down during that time. So I know we talk a lot about sort of the impact of the pandemic, but a number of the, the trends related to language development prior to the pandemic actually were probably going in the wrong direction too. So whether that will that be amplified or exacerbated, who knows in that process, but it will give us some pretty good data to be able to look at sort of a comparison to pre-COVID, post-COVID, where does this group of kids lie in terms of then gives pretty good individual student sort of parts in terms of an identification screener for 
kids with vulnerabilities to be able to have us then intervene at that process. So stay tuned for, for that. That will be this spring. And then with the idea, that, <clears throat> then we'll get report in the fall. So we'll be able to see in the fall in terms of that process. So I know that's a little bit off topic, but it does give us an opportunity to be able to see where this group of kids are. Great, thank you both for the answer. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it how it all plays out for our kids over the next few years. But I really am excited uh, about all the uh, the engagement, the in person engagement for them happening right now. So thank you so much for sharing all of that, Shannon. It's uh, it's extra exciting to see. I feel like they're they're our early kids, our young kids are a group that need it uh, so much. So I'm really happy to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I didn't see any other questions or comments, so I will keep us moving there. All right, so that takes us to uh, staff reports B, school-based professional assessments to support programming with uh, Dr. Bronwyn Davis. So thank you so much for your patience, uh, Dr. Davis. We've got you far down on our agenda here, so I appreciate you sticking with us. And uh, Superintendent Samus, did you want to start us off there? Sure, and I'll and I'll and my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Davis. Uh, many in the committee will remember Dr. Bill Colvin, who was our senior psychologist um, for for many years in the board. Um, Dr. Colvin retired last year, um, and we are thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to be able to hire Dr. Davis. So, Dr. Davis actually is our senior manager of clinical services and psychology. So, actually manages not only our psychology staff and all the different assessments both done by internal and external agencies, but also our clinical staff, like our SLPs, our, uh, uh, I won't go through all the acronyms of all of our clinical staff to be able to do it, but lots and lots of clinical staff that, that really dovetail with the educators in terms of being able to provide clinical supports and, and drive a number of our programs. So as they say, thrilled to have Dr. Davis here tonight to introduce her um, to the committee, but also talk about where we're going in terms of uh, special education assessments, some of which are school-based, some of which are um, sort of curriculum-based, some are standardized, some are done by internal clinicians, some external clinicians, so a, a huge wide range of different clinical services. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Davis to talk about sort of school-based assessments 101 and sort of where we're heading in terms of assessments. Okay, thank you. And hopefully I've shared my screen appropriately. So make a signal if not, thank you. Um, so yeah, three, three chairperson that refute the committee. Uh, the Simcoe County District School Board is committed to providing outstanding educational opportunities and outcomes in a learning environment that enables all students to reach their goals and achieve success. So this evening's update will highlight the role professional assessments play in working towards uh, these commitments. Really the role and effectiveness of professional assessments are best understood in the overall context of a continuous cycle of assessment that really uh, informs and drives effective instruction. And so much assessment is integrated into all aspects of the uh, classroom and classroom learning activities. There are a large number of formal and informal assessments that our educators are using to inform and drive their instructions. When there are challenges um, in learning that persist and further information is needed, special education resource teachers, so our CERTs or centrally assigned special education staff may administer some uh, select standardized assessments to help determine strengths to build upon uh, and areas that require some specific support. Here in uh, Simcoe County District School Board, the most widely used standardized assessment at this point is the Kaufman test of educational achievement, the KTS-3. So that provides a, a standardized test of really key academic skills. Another tool that's used by our central uh, special education staff is the Vineland-3, and that's a standardized rating scale of adaptive functioning, so daily life skills. When the learning profile is especially complex or there's very specific uh, needs, or the student continues to experience challenges despite uh, those, um, the information gathered through those other assessments, then more in-depth professional assessments can sometimes be beneficial. So today's update will focus on speech language assessments and psychoeducational assessments, though to note there are many other assessments that Simcoe County District School Board students do receive both internally through our special education department, but also through 
uh, you know, community, community agencies. And I will note before going into those assessments in more depth that really the information from all of these assessments, each sort of layer of these assessments, uh, that information is used to identify needs and help identify teaching strategies to meet those needs uh, throughout this process. Uh, students are provided with interventions as needs are identified. So for example, in um, Simcoe County District School Board, that would include evidence-based reading intervention programs such as the SRA Reading Mastery and Lexia Core 5. Those interventions don't require a professional assessment in order to access them. Often students have been accessing those prior to um, being referred for an assessment. So we'll begin with speech language assessments. Uh, these are carried out by board speech language pathologists or SLPs. There are several types of assessments that they provide in our school board. So speech assessments, these include assessments of articulation, fluency, voice, and resonance. They also complete language assessments, which are uh, more comprehensive assessments around a student's receptive and expressive language needs. So their ability to understand and their ability to express oral language, uh, as well as their literacy skills. And then they also provide consultations. And when they say consultations here, the team, they are really referring to more functional communication assessments. These are ones where they're typically um, providing assessments to students who are minimally verbal or nonverbal and uh, requiring a communication tool or communication system in place. So here I've summarized these, uh, the speech language assessments that occurred by board SLPs last year and this year. So you'll see the 2021 to 22 school year. And I'll note that these numbers also include assessments that would be completed in the summer, which we sometimes have the ability to do with uh, additional ministry funding. So here uh, last year, they completed 588 speech assessments, 152 language assessments, and 126 consultations. Thus far for the year, uh, for the current school year, as of March 29th, they had received 743 speech assessment referrals, 69 language assessment referrals, and 69 consultations. I'll note that we added two additional SLPs, speech language pathologists, to our uh, board complement this year. So we have more staff being able to provide assessments and the, you'll notice the kind of ratio of numbers has changed here as well. And that also reflects the fact that there's been some shifts in their model of service delivery to more flexibly um, respond to school's needs, sort of the varying needs of individual schools. There are many outcomes uh, that are supported from speech language assessments. So certainly they inform tier one classroom-based supports. They help inform the development or the update of individual education plans um, and also formal identica identifications for exceptional students. Uh, many of these assessments also support referrals for intervention. So a large majority of those speech assessments support uh, referrals to either internal intervention um, or referrals to um, SBRS, the school-based rehab services, to receive speech intervention. And then again, uh, from those consultations, they support the implementation of alternative and augmentative communication devices. So many key essential uh, components. Psychoeducational assessments um, aim to provide a really comprehensive understanding of a student's learning profile of individual strengths and needs. And they do so by assessing a number of different abilities uh, and processes, some of which are displayed here. So for example, reasoning or problem solving, academic skills, adaptive daily living skills, social emotional functioning, mental health needs. Um, and really it's about understanding uh, the how these different pieces interact and uh, connect together to help us understand sort of students in a comprehensive way. And of course, what we look at would depend a little on the uh, referral question or what's being asked in particular. Psychoeducational assessments always 
aim to describe a student's strengths and needs, uh, provide sort of a really clear profile. And that those are then used to help inform those tier one classroom based supports, also inform the individual education plan um, and sometimes inform formal identifications for exceptional students. Uh, when appropriate, they may also include a formal diagnosis. So often in the school setting, these include a learning disability, uh, ADHD and intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, also mental health related diagnoses such as depression or anxiety. Well, the Simcoe County District School Board doesn't require a formal diagnosis to access special education programming, so it's important to know that. Um, certainly an accurate diagnosis can still help guide some of the programming decisions or help families access community supports and services, um, such as the Ontario Autism Program, and then certainly the supports that families receive um, in our community, uh, we hope would then also in turn support their functioning overall, and that would include within our, our uh, Simcoe County uh, School Board. We uh, do not utilize a formal ongoing wait list for psychoeducational assessments. Schools make referrals based on individual student needs. Uh, they are provided with a number of assessments per year that's based on their school enrollment. And additional assessments are provided through uh, central kind of consultation as needed. So that if schools have a need beyond what they were allotted, there is opportunity to for us to uh, respond to that need. And so those assessments that are referred within a year are completed within that same school year in most scenarios. Most psychoeducational assessments are completed, um, well, in Simcoe County District School Board, they're completed by both internal psychology staff and by uh, approved external psychological service providers in our community. Uh, this allows us to really maximize the number of assessments that are being provided. Uh, because there are internal psychology staff vacancies. There's no age that we set out as a requirement to participate in a psychoeducational assessment, no minimal age per se. Uh, most referrals will involve students that tend to be grade three or above, and this is usually to follow that process of assessment that I described at the beginning. So the opportunity to um, transition to school, uh, have the opportunity to be informed by those earlier stages of assessment. That being said, uh, assessments can be completed with younger children and are when uh, they are appropriate and if there is a need. So during the 2021-22 school year, the uh, Simcoe County District School Board completed approximately 410 psychoeducational assessments. That would also include those completed during the summer months. Thus far, referrals received as of last week included uh, 326 referrals for psych assessments. Uh, and if I estimate the number I'm expecting over the course of the spring and anticipating for completion in the summer, should we receive additional ministry funding, uh, I would anticipate approximately 400 assessments for the year. I also want to note that the Simcoe County District School Board recognizes that maximizing diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of the system really requires ongoing efforts to increase awareness and unlearn and change our practices. And this also applies in the context of professional assessments. So over the course of the past two years, there have been efforts to uh, increase awareness of bias um, and inequity and racism within professional assessments through PD, um, sort of in internal and external PD for our staff in hopes that we're building assessment practices that are really consistent with more anti-oppressive, anti-biased and equity um, principles. And we have also shared this information or shared some information to our external psychological service providers outlining expected practices and uh, providing supporting resources. So next steps include continuing to build our internal staff complement. We uh, add staff when there's funding available, also supporting um, this through supporting education, such as practicum and internship placements. Uh, the special education department proposed increasing funding for uh, contracted assessments for the upcoming school year to maximize the assessments we can provide and respond to the fact that fees for contracted assessments are increasing. 
We continue to reflect on our models of service delivery to see ways that we can maximize impact in the system and make use of additional ministry funding as it is made available to us. And finally, to continue to ensure that diversity, equity, and inclusion principles remain a focus in the context of professional assessments as well. Uh, so thank you, and I would welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. I appreciate that. Great. All right. Do we have any questions? Kevin? I have a whole bunch of questions, but I'll, I'll start with one. Um, approximately how many of the um, referrals come from schools and how many come from um, the extras, so to speak? So if I'm understanding correctly, how many do we do we sort of allot out and then how many are held back to kind of oh, make yes, use? Yes. So um, I would, I think, I don't have that exact number in front of me, but I believe around 50 assessments were held back as being able to respond to needs um, as they came up and the rest were uh, sort of allotted out based on population. Uh, and so some of those schools may directly reach out to uh, myself or Superintendent Zamis or um, you know, the principal of special education to express a need. Uh, many of those, they reach out directly to their family of schools consultants who, because they have a good sense of their kind of family of schools and the needs there help kind of uh, allocate additional referrals if needed. And, and Kevin, Kevin, if I can add sort of the sort of the rationale behind that and recognizing that, you know, you try to be able to figure out um, one is how do you keep the train rolling the whole time and the train with you try to be able to and I hate to sort of use sort of a train analogy, but it's a big train that needs to keep going and all the people need to keep working on it. That if we did the whole thing based on just do referrals without sort of an allocation model at the beginning, it's tough to keep it moving at sort of a pace to be able to do that. So they can sort of feed all the, the, the external and internal providers so that they can plan the timing all the way through so that we don't end up with sort of a March and a recommendation of 400 assessments coming in at March to be able to do that. So, you know, if, when, we, when we have moved to more of a sort of a less, as, less school weighted model to be able to do it, we had difficulty of schools sort of not putting in the referral September 1st to be able to do that. So that we ended up then with sort of an overwhelming number in the spring, but couldn't upside, upscale that whole thing to keep the whole train going. So, you know, again, when you're trying to be able to keep sort of all the staff working internal and external and all that process coming up with what's the magical balance to say, how do we get the assessments coming in equally in September but then have the flexibility to accommodate the needs within the system that as it goes. So trying to be able to have sort of a blended model of, you know, recognizing that, um, you know, it's trying to sort of keep the process working, but also the same, try to be able to recognize the needs of individual schools that a student may not present himself, you know, in sort of that or herself sort of at that time to say, how do we accommodate the needs of a school that may not have sort of identified sort of early on to be able to do that. But if I was going to say 80-20, I wouldn't be probably far off in terms of that process of an 80% school weighted model and a 20% model of sort of the flexibility where the consultants and the principals, the spec ed and um, Dr. Davis has the flexibility to then be able to do a recommendation to change that. Thank you. Uh, Pamela, you have a question? I think it's a quick question. I don't know if it's best for Dr. Davis or Superintendent Samus. I'm just curious what um, what is the formula to determine a school allotment? Is it overall population, like the total population of a school, or is it to the population of students that have been identified with an exceptionality? And and generally, we do a, a, the first initial allocation is just enrollment at the school. Um, the the students that already have an exceptionality. For the most part, the vast majority of those students actually already probably have a psych ed assessment that was completed recently, recently that probably gave the formal identification to be able to do that. So that then becomes a discussion as to, which is another part as to, do we do a psych ed assessment regularly to be able to do that, right? And so 
again, we would do, and I know that's not your question, but that sort of would be sort of where it would lead to in terms of if there's a certain number of students that have special education classes or students with exceptionalities, would that warrant more, more or less type of assessments? Not necessarily either, or it could, depending on if the needs change to be able to do that. But generally speaking, the allocation is based on enrollment as a, as a baseline, and then the flexibility outside of that to allow the flexibility. Okay, so just to follow up to that, so if you have a school that maybe has a higher number of students, like a higher needs school, you have the flexibility to sort of make those adjustments. Absolutely. Like yeah. Thank you. Because that's why we that's why we try to have both things. We said it didn't work to do it. It didn't work to go either one way or the other completely because the one way of just school based allocations didn't recognize the needs that we could have a small school that has incredibly high needs one year and a large school that doesn't or vice versa to be able to do it. And again, the part of doing to all needs based was it didn't keep the whole process going where sort of Bronwyn has to keep, or Dr. Davis has to keep her whole staff and all the agencies who also don't have the ability to sort of say, you know, you know, when we, you know, all of a sudden get money bombs from the ministry and they say, okay, roll this out within three months and do all these assessments. You then need to find psychologists to do all those assessments or speech pathologists, which don't exist, right? So you can't say, well, let's just phone company X and have them do 30 or 40 assessments because they also don't have the staff to be able to do that. So again, it's trying to be able to balance that whole thing so that this, this whole train keeps running the whole time all the way through so we don't get to this time of year where everyone then emails to Dr. Davis and says, well, I've got these six assessments I need done in our school. And we say, well, there is no way to sort of quickly turn that around. No, that makes sense. Thank you. I can add just an example for you that we had, you know, initially based on population for one school allocated five assessments um, and they actually in a sense returned two to me because they didn't have the needs and their families were choosing to seek them privately primarily and another school that based on uh, the uh, projected enrollment received three assessments as their allotment, but we've actually given that school an additional four. So that school has received seven assessments. So it, we are trying to respond to the needs as best as we can. Great, thank you very much. All right, any other questions or comments? Kevin? Uh, yeah. Kevin, go ahead. We did Can you hear me, Kevin? Go ahead. Which seemed a little odd to me. I'm wondering if we have uh, what our numbers are these days. How many continues we do? How many uh, Finlands we do? And uh, versus our psych ends. Yeah, so I don't have those, no, the KT and the Vineland numbers offhand. The Vineland is a fairly um, new measure in terms of being rolled out in our system by our central consultants. Um, so, you know, I think within the last year, they may have done around 50 or so of those, but the more we see use for them, the more they are uh, likely going to use those. Um, and those are happening sometimes in that process, like I said, maybe before you get to a psych ed assessment, but they're also a valuable tool for these for students who have maybe had an assessment, but the school's looking for some more specific programming goals moving forward. Uh, so I anticipate that may um, move. I'm not sure if Superintendent Sam Samus might know the answer to the KTAs, but those are those are occurring uh, most often in schools by cert in the school building that have been trained in them. So I. I suspect that they are doing um, a fairly high number of KTs in a year. So, and, and we could get, I don't know if we get that in a route to be able to think, to be able to do that. I do know that we buy licenses and we buy licenses centrally for the KTA licenses. So we could probably figure out what the number of KTA licenses that we buy to be able to do it. And then schools then sort of draw on that licenses to be able, those licenses to be able to do that. Um, the KTA, for those who don't know, the KTA is a, is a standardized, Sort of academic achievement different than uh, an aptitude assessment it's an academic achievement test that's normed uh, against student norms grade and age level norms to be able to do that 
but actually gives in, I don't want to say probably, um, I'll say, I definitely won't say as much information because we actually do sort of an academic achievement test and a psychoeducational assessment, but is a pretty comprehensive assessment that's done by certs and we train all certs in every school to be able to do that. It's not a 10 minute test though. It's a pretty significant test to be able to do. So when some people think, well, why don't we just do KTLs on every single kid, you know, five times a year, it's a, it's a fairly comprehensive test that, that, that we sort of don't go into and say, well, let's just do it all the time. But I think it is valuable to do to be able to see where the child's achieving at um, in addition to the school-based assessments, right? So, you know, in terms of what, what Dr. Davis said, I think everything is sort of part of layers there are layers of an onion to be able to do it where, you know, there's lots of school-based assessments that curriculum-based assessments that, that educators use every single day, but sometimes they don't tell us what we need to be able to do. And so if they don't, then, you know, what's another tool in the toolkit to be able to do that? And if we're looking at alternative sort of goals, then, you know, are we looking at, or alternative pages, can a Vineland provide sort of a context of what are the goals we're seeing in sort of, a, of that to be able to do it? And does that add? If that's not sort of what we need to be able to do, and we can't figure out sort of the the educational level to be able to program for, you can look at a KT and the KT, I mean, can be used. And I know that, that, uh, that Haley Mills Knapp is probably far more skilled than I am than doing a KT. We can do parts of a KT or a whole KT. Um, and so, you know, I think sometimes schools think I need to do this whole KT. Sometimes there's just parts of the KT that, that, that provide that. So, you know, I think there are a variety of different parts of this to be able to sort of peel back and say, you know, is it a school-based educational curriculum assessment? Is it an alternative assessment that we start looking at in terms of providing sort of standardization? Is it a psychoeducational assessment? So, you know, I think, you know, oftentimes people say, my child needs a psych ed assessment. They may not need a psych ed assessment in that process. They may have had a psych ed assessment when the child's in grade four that demonstrated sort of a, a specific learning profile, but they might need a KT a number of times during their career to be able to say they're transitioning from grade eight to right grade nine. What's the correct placement? Are we looking at sort of a um, sort of a learning center or a regular class placement? What's the placement we're looking at? Is the child looking at were they in a developmental skills class? But they were like, I think they actually shouldn't be in a developmental skills class. They probably should be in a locally developed class going to secondary school. I think there are there are times to be able to do that where, you know, we need to be able to do that. But I don't think, you know, it's not something that needs to be done all the time, but it is a wonderful tool in the toolkit that that is pretty comprehensive and gives an actually pretty good profile that then you can build an IEP on with quite a bit of strength. Anyway, answered more of your question that I don't know how many KTs we do across the system. I know we train lots and lots and lots of certs every year to be able to do it. But we probably could if we really figured out a way to measure what the drawdown on the licenses that we buy, because the, the actual license is then produced through the Q Global report. I think we probably could figure out what the number actually is in that process. Is that is that correct, Dr. Davis? I agree. I think we could find out that number just and it would be helpful to, you know, as we're understanding the role of professional assessments in the context of all of these other assessments, I recognize that having an understanding of those numbers would be helpful. Um, and yeah, certainly KTs are being used both sort of, again, in that it might be a process prior to a professional assessment as a way of directing programming in advance, but certainly also after, right? So the same student might have multiple KTs to support those transitions. When it's less likely, they'll have multiple assessments, although sometimes that does happen as well. Uh, so. We will have to dig deeper for that one for you, though. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, everyone. I apologize, I had to turn my video off. My internet is uh, not being very reliable again. Um, okay, any other questions or comments? I just had one more quick question All and right. another I'm number question. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. My internet, like I said, everyone was frozen on me. Kristen, please go ahead. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, just curious, you mentioned that you have two, the additional two SLPs. I'm curious to know what the complement is now. How many do we have in total? We have eight SLPs in total right now. That's awesome. Thank you. And 10 SLAs. Yes. Also 10 speech language assistants. Great, thank you. 
like I said, everyone's kind of freezing for me. So I really apologize if I'm missing anyone. Is there, is there any other questions or comments? And, and, and Kristen, I'll go back to sort of, sort of as sort of numbers in that process. I mean, most definitely a recognition that we've seen sort of, sort of the impact of oral language coming out of the pandemic and the, the importance of sort of right to read and reading and all those different types of things to be able to do that, to send prioritize also the ability to be able to find speech pathologists, which we cross our fingers and that we continue to be able to find speech pathologists. Um, yeah, me but, we were, <laughs> but we were successful in finding speech pathologists. So I mean, but again, sort of the priority of saying, you know, sort of seeing where the 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 light is going in this sort of tunnel and it is going towards sort of early literacy support and language development and sort of all those different types of things, also recognizing sort of the vulnerabilities we see of kids coming out of the pandemic and so prioritizing sort of we've in the last couple of years have added four speech, four speech and language assistants and two more speech pathologists. Um, and I, it wouldn't surprise me for us to continue to see that team grow sort of in recognizing that, but then also then changing their role to be able to see, and you see, you saw what uh, uh, Dr. Davis talked about sort of the changing role in terms of trying to get them more into the classroom to be able to do more than just assessments, trying to get them to do tier one supports in our kindergarten and primary classes about how do we use their skills that, probably where they are the, the pros in the area of language development, how do we use them to be able to sort of guide a number of the instructions? And then the last part of that is sort of giving the schools the flexibilities where we used to say, you get a certain number of language assessments and certain number of speech assessments. A number of our schools started to say, I don't need those, that specific group, I need this group. And so really recognizing that sort of one takes more time than the other, but seeing sort of a more, um, more speech, and I think I'm correct, more speech assessments rather than full language assessments, which then also drive the program of the SLAs that can provide direct support to those kids. So. Great, thank you for the further details, Chris. All right, uh, any other questions or comments? Please, if I'm missing anyone, just feel free to speak up. Like I said, everyone's kind of freezing on me. All right, I'm not seeing anything. Okay, so I will move us on, thank you. Uh, okay, so that takes us to committee reports, which we have none. Um, so then we'll move on to SEAC member updates. So do we have any member updates? Kevin, please go ahead. Oh, you're muted, Kevin. Sorry, I'm not usually muted. Um, yesterday was World Autism Awareness Day. Um, and since it was on a Sunday, um, the school board is celebrating it today. Um, the theme this year is celebrating the spectrum. Autism has been in the news a lot in this millennium as the numbers have grown and pretty much everybody is aware of autism. It's touched most people's families. What celebrating the spectrum is about it's about moving past awareness and on to acceptance. That autistics are not a disease that needs to be cured, but they are a group within our community which needs to be accepted and accommodated. Um, so that's really what the celebrating the spectrum is, celebrating the diversity within our community. Um, and I thank the school board for all the efforts they've done to um, acknowledge uh, the day. Great. Thank I think you. I want to add to that. So, so uh, Trustee Rafiq, if I can add just sort of a brief to it, and I'm just going to share my screen a little bit. And so, um, and, and absolutely, Kevin. So I think sort of the moving beyond sort of the sort of autism awareness to really about sort of educating, figuring out ways how to be able to educate acceptance. And so as a, as a school board, we're about teaching, we're about learning, and we're about teaching sort of our staff, but also our kids and our families, sort of about what it means to, to have a child with autism in the classroom. So um, one of the, the, the resources that we distributed to, the, uh, to all of our schools, and there's an elementary and secondary, and I'll see if I can figure out sort of how to, let me see how I can do this without sort of shutting down all my screens. Okay, I think I'm. Do they? Do I have? Do I have the elementary educator toolkit open? I think so. Is that? Can everyone see the the toolkit that that I have yeah. open? 
Yep. Yes. Perfect. There. So what? So one of the things that that Autism Ontario actually put out and and has done a really nice job actually is the um, have put together a sort of a teaching tool for all of our schools, elementary and secondary, with a variety of activities and some really neat activities. And so, as he said, what you know, Kevin's talking about sort of um, going beyond the idea of sort of are we raising a flag? Are we are we wearing specific colors or things like that? Moving beyond that whole process to sort of learning about it. What does it mean? What does it mean to have a, a person that has autism in your classroom? How do we support that? So um, as you see, Autism Ontario has put out a pretty nice educational package for that. So what you're, what you're seeing sort of in the schools is more than just sort of a one day type of um, uh, awareness, but really is about how do we teach about it? And so as you say, the was sent out to our system a whole bunch of different things in terms of educator resources about what uh, World Autism Awareness Day is, but actually some pretty good classroom activities talking about neurodiversity and further conversation, but as well, all different types of videos and things like that. And, I, and because of our time, I won't get into this, but um, those of you who, who have young children who, who are well aware of things like Sesame Street and Thomas the Tank Engine, there are actually characters in it that are that are um, supportive of, of teaching about that. And so uh, links to Sort of Bruno is uh, one of the new characters in Thomas the Tank Engine. Again, if you have kids, you know who Thomas the Tank Engine is. But actually, they actually have a, a, a young student um, named Elliot who actually is the, the voice behind it. And Elliot is a young boy and, and has autism. So the sort of authenticity of using a, a child with autism to be actually the voice to be able to do it. Um, and if you watch the video, it actually takes you to a link in terms of an interview with the child and, and some of the parts to do with the uh, uh, that, but again, I won't take you into Thomas the Tank Engine, although I do love Thomas the Tank Engine and I thought it'd be a great thing to be able to show Thomas, but I don't have time. Then we get into Sesame Street and again, Sesame Street, um, wonderful children's program to be able to do that, but using sort of a tool to be able to sort of meet kids where they're at and teach kids um, what it means to have autism, what it means to have a friend with autism, what it means to have a sibling with autism, and a whole set of discussion guides, how to be able to watch the videos, talking about the character strengths, sort of a whole bunch of different things. And again, I mean, I won't go into the whole detail, but a pretty nice package of doing that. And I think in trying to be able to illustrate beyond the idea that we need to move beyond just awareness. It is about sort of how do we use, how do we use schools really foundational principle, which is about teaching kids about what it means to have autism, right? And so I think that's sort of a nice sort of next step as opposed to, is it a symbolic way to be able to look at how do we recognize that um, the children have autism but how do we actually teach about it in our schools? And so, as they say, um, quite a nice, quite a nice uh, set of resources that's been distributed, and, and that will be, and that is far more than just sort of yesterday and today. That really goes out through the whole month in a variety of different activities, and whether they are stories, questions, question prompts, videos, a whole bunch of different things. So, as they say, thank you very much to Autism Ontario for creating those resources, and they've been widely distributed through our schools. Great, thank you very much. I love to see the uh, the growth in the learning and the discussion surrounding autism. So thank you very much for updating us on that. Uh, Pamela, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, on behalf of Easter Seals, just to let everybody know that the last week of May is National Accessibility Week and May 31st is Red Shirt Day. And I have to say I was really um, happy and proud that when I attended our um, Ontario Regional Meeting for Easter Seals, that uh, the Simcoe County District School Board was already on the list as having agreed to participate, um, which was great for me because I didn't have to do any work to try and get everybody on board. So thank you to Superintendent Samus and all of the, um, the principals of special education as well for being on board with that. Um, and really the point of the week is just improving understanding and knowledge of, Canadian, uh, of Canadians um, uh, about our friends and neighbors and those with um, uh, uh, regarding accessibility and inclusion. Just uh, again, it's more of an awareness. One thing that I will say on a personal note is we've had um, our son in the Simcoe County District School Board now for 13 years, 14 years. And I think that accommodating physical disabilities is something that this board has done really well all along, at least in our personal experience. Um, we really haven't had any issues in that regard. And I'm, I was really proud that, that the board was willing to participate in this as well. So 
Um, I have more resources on that that I can share at our next meeting. And I also just want to put out there in case anybody um, is interested, Easter Sales has a lot of uh, scholarships for students that are exiting post exiting secondary education, going on to post secondary education. Um, there's I think the last time I looked, there were at least 15 different scholarships that were available and those applications are closing at the end of April. So I just want to put that out there as well. And it's on their website. So Thank you. Pam, Pam, can you send me that information so I can distribute to our secondary schools? Because I can get it right to our secondary school chairs, which will sure. know the students who are graduating. So I can get it probably closer to the people who most likely are gonna apply for it. 100%, I'll send that off to you tonight. Great, thank you very much, Pamela. All right, uh, any other CF member updates? Okay, I'm not seeing any. All right, so then that will take us to, uh, to board member updates. Okay, uh, sorry, I keep telling me my internet's unstable. Um, so just quickly, I just ease our chair did just recently send our need for more schools to be built. It is a, a very big need in our in our uh, board right now. Um, trustees are all just this past November. So we've been receiving for all understanding our roles and responsibility working through uh, lots of parts of the budget. Um, we are hoping to be able to pass the budget in May or, or June if need be. Um, but we are just kind of working through lots of bits and pieces of that. It's uh, it's a lot to get through. So that's um, one of the big things that we've been focused on as trustees. Uh, I'm not sure if Trustee Bites or Trustee Talbot had anything else you wanted to add for board updates. All right, I'm not seeing anybody else so worried that I'm lagging. So if you need to interrupt me, please somebody tell me if I'm lagging. All right, okay, so our golden buzzer. That's me. Um, and good evening, everybody. And through you, Chair Rafiq, to the committee. Uh, I have talked at great length about our Bayview program and I do have another success story I wanted to share. Uh, Although the students do have a co-op, they are there for the entire day. In some, in some cases, the co-ops are only an hour. So there's still a considerable amount of teaching that does happen at the uh, Bayview Center. Uh, one of the students whose sibling is in a grade 10 art class uh, had observed what their brother had done in the art class and had asked the teachers if, if they could do it. So. Sure enough, uh, they, they did set it up. Uh, 10 students with hammers and nails. Uh, I just wanted to show you some of the string art that they, they created. Uh, it, it really was an incredible time. Fortunately, I wasn't there to see the students work through this, but as uh, Brian McIsaac, the principal, had gone over and every child was so complete engaged in the work that was being done. Uh, they were incredibly excited. Um, you know, there was reservations, lots of nails, there's hammers, uh, but to, to be honest, and as Brian shared with me, the, 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 kid, the kids were amazing, and they were so incredibly excited. Uh, the school has a display that they set up to uh, show all the kids' work, and um, again, just to speak of the enthusiasm, commitment to complete the work that was being asked and put out in front of them was, was really an incredible task. Uh, the students did work over several days. Uh, they, they were so excited 
to display their art. And again, I was so proud of uh, Innisdale for uh, really acknowledging and recognizing these students. And it, and it gives me um, great joy to actually say that we are opening another class in 2024 in the Bradford area, as we are finding a need with the students in our life skills class that we're able to accommodate and give real life situations. Uh, part of the other piece is the, um, all the students have city bus passes and part of the skill is, is getting to their co-op. And although the program does have a van, uh, the staff and the students have been very excited about accessing real life strategies and, and working through uh, with the bus passes. And that again has been uh, an incredible success. Uh, there's been some bumps, but certainly in no, uh, no injuries, no one lost, uh, you know, even some of the staff have come back and said, I haven't been on a bus since I was a child. So it, it is kind of a neat experience. And, you know, I'm, I'm also happy to say how the, the city of Barrie and the transit um, company in Barrie have worked hard too to help and work with the class to, to set up these opportunities for the students. So I, I know that um, we talk about space, we talk about the need to uh, build new schools. I, I'm just, proud of the department, the schools, and these kids that, and the students, that we are finding alternate locations to make these programs a success. And uh, I, I'm just proud of every person that's been involved. Anyway, I know we're trying to stay on time. So good night, everybody. And thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Really appreciate it. That's always one of the best parts. Um, okay, so we have to stay within our rules. I swear we're going to be done this meeting in like two minutes, but we do need a motion to go over one of these meetings. We will not have that. I promise. <laughs> Mark, you're laughing at me the hardest. Can I, <laughs> I'm going to make you move. Uh, Kevin. All right. Uh, do I have a second for that motion? Mark, thank you. All in favor. Wonderful. Any opposed? All right, and that carries, but we are very close to being finished. Okay, um, all right, so next up we have correspondence, which we have none. Uh, other matters, does anyone have anything for other matters? Any questions or anything? All right, not seeing any. Uh, any notice of motion for next meeting? All right, not seeing any there either. All right, so look at we had to have a motion for one whole minute. <laughs> All right, so I would be looking for a motion to adjourn. <laughs> uh, Mark, thank you. Seconded by Kevin. Wonderful. All in favor? Any opposed? All right, and that carries. Thank you. So I did just want to mention, I want to remind everyone that we do upcoming have our combined uh, budget meeting with the trustees. It will be at the Education Center Wednesday, April 19th at 6 p.m. in person. If anyone cannot make it, please make sure you let Tina know just so that we can track quorum. Um, other than that, our next regularly scheduled meeting will be on May the 8th, 2023, and that will be online.